I just have to ask you, is it true that a Minnesota legislator referred to you as, not my words, his words, quote, that little blonde broad who's always surrounded by wheelchairs? That is true. Is it true that you were called, quote, the man whom nursing home owners have nightmares about, end quote. Welcome to the NCA's podcast, Conversations on Aging and Justice, your trusted source for the latest in news, research, and policy in elder justice. The NCEA is excited to introduce the OGs of Elder Justice series, where you'll hear trailblazers in the field share their passions, joys, collaborations, frustrations, and innovations, or any combination thereof in elder justice through informal and candid conversations. In this episode of the OGs of Elder Justice, Bill Benson and Iris Freeman reflect on their inspiring careers in elder justice. They share insightful anecdotes from their work, discuss legislative achievements, and highlight the invaluable lessons gleaned from past policy struggles. They stress the importance of advocacy and passing the baton to the next generation of champions in the field. Bill Benson has worked in the aging field for five decades at the local, state, and national levels, including as a state long-term care ombudsman, senior congressional staff in the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives, and a political appointee at the U.S. Administration on Aging, including Acting Assistant Secretary for Aging. Iris Freeman, a longtime elder advocate and educator, is the founding board chair of the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. She's brought long-term care consumer perspectives to state and local working groups and lawmakers since the 1970s and has served as a public policy advisor to seniors and labor organizations. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, we met in the early 80s at annual conference of the National Citizens Coalition for Nursing Home Reform. That's now the consumer voice, of course. Uh, we were at the National 4-H Center outside of uh, the District of Columbia, and you were the California State Ombudsman. I was a National Citizens Coalition board member, and in Minnesota, uh, I was directing local ombudsman work, which included substantial state policy advocacy. What do you remember? That's exactly right, Iris. Uh, we met at the Nickner Conference. It was May 18th through 22nd, 1983 at that infamous 4-H Center, 41 years ago this May. And we're still friends all these years later, and we're still working <laughs> together for elder justice at NAPSA, the National Adult Protective Services Association, where I serve as their national policy advisor, as I've done since 1998. And Iris, you're a board member and an irreplaceable policy committee member. I might just add that much of the NAPSA policy committee focus is on federal support for states for APS through the Elder Justice Act and the all important to APS, at least social services block grant. We do address other matters that affect both APS and APS clients, you know, like guardianship reform and Medicaid, for example. So Iris, got a question for you. What fueled our commitment to our careers in elder justice? And I'll go first. Early in my career, working at the California Department of Aging in the fall of 1975, California Department of Aging got a grant from the Administration on Aging, now Administration for Community Living, to train paralegals to help seniors, as we called them then, with their legal problems. And CDA, Department of Aging, contracted that work out to an organization called the National Paralegal Institute in San Francisco. They had a Washington, D.C. office. In fact, that's where Elma Holder, who was to become founder of Nickner, uh, was working. And part of the deal is the department loaned me to the National Paralegal Institute to work on this project for three years with the notion that when I returned to the department, I would continue the work that we were doing uh, in legal services and training paralegals. That time was a profound elder justice learning experience for me, although we didn't call it elder justice in those days. Uh, just to jump forward a little bit, 
Um, I returned to the department as planned. I was an assistant to the state ombudsman and the legal services developer. They both left. I don't think I drove them off. I hope not, but they both left. I became the legal services developer and started searching for an ombudsman. Well, that's a long story. We couldn't find the right person. So I ended up becoming the state long-term care ombudsman and we hired a legal services developer. And then of course, later um, in the early um, mid 1980s, I then moved to Washington DC, which is where we met. How about you, Iris? Well, indeed my commitment started uh, inexplicitly, but very, very early. Uh, like many people in our field, I had a strong relationship with my grandparents. In fact, we grew up in my maternal uh, grandparents' house. And so older people were my protectors. They were my allies. So fortunately, I had the opportunity to be part of their last decades and their last days, which unfortunately were in hospitals. And the experiences I had as even a very young family member in a hospital setting um, created fundamentally unacceptable uh, impressions that would last. So decades later, I, I found um, that I had an interest in health policy, and that resulted in my graduate school social work placements being first in a busy county hospital um, where I worked with patients on neurology and a lot of experience then um, with discharges to nursing homes and financial exploitation and Medicaid applications. It, it was a tremendous learning experience. Uh, I learned, among other things, that I wasn't destined to be a very good caseworker. Um, but luckily, my second field placement was at our state health department in community health, um, where my assignments led me to the state legislature. And I caught the state policy bug, and there's no cure, you know. How about you? Well, I, I caught the, the bug at state policy <laughs> myself in California, uh, and then later got the federal bug, of which you also have uh, that incurable yes. disease as well. Uh, I know. Well, but, you know, for us, the the decade of the, the 80s was very full. It was a time to, to build and a time to defend um, in Minnesota as well as nationally. Nationally, um, we had begun the work of the Institute of Medicine Committee, and I was so fortunate to be able to serve on that body and work to envision and, and map out what would be effective nursing home reg regulation, this all in the face of, of pro massively proposed deregulation. Um, Statewide, um, we passed the first adult abuse reporting law in Minnesota in 1980. Um, it did for other states. This was just a very formative time. Ohio passed its adult abuse reporting law then, too. In Minnesota, we accomplished a, the first comprehensive state bill of rights for nursing home residents. But, but we were also very, very hard at work defending the hard-won gains, both in funding and in regulation of of care facilities because of dramatic, well, they seemed dramatic at the time, uh, state and federal budget cuts. I mean, an example would have been um, the proposed elimination of our state office of health facility complaints simply because um, by some estimates there wasn't the money. We, we did uh, forestall that, and in, in fact, it remains today. Well, I, I will agree with you, uh, Iris, the decade of the 80s was indeed a time to build and a time to defend. I, I spent the first part of the 1980s um, working at the California Department of Aging as the state long-term care ombudsman, working on nursing home reform in California, uh, trying to build the state's capacity to thoroughly and, and appropriately provide oversight over both nursing homes and what we call residential facilities for the elderly. I worked on building and promoting legal services for the elderly in California, guardianship reform. I had the privilege of helping to write a number of California laws, our first mandatory reporting law, advanced directives, statutes. Um, I wrote the first statutory SHIP program in the country that uh, was in statute. 
that was called HICAP. And of course, it became a model for the HICAP program nationally. And then in 1985, I went to Congress um, in the early 1990s and worked for uh, three committees overall, the House Select Committee on Aging, the Senate Special Committee on Aging, as well as the Senate Labor and Human Resources Committee that we call the HELP Committee today. When I arrived in Washington in 1985, Congress was really at the beginning of its drive towards reforming nursing home care in America, at least doing what they could to do that, that culminated in the landmark over 87 nursing home reform legislation. One of my proudest bits of work, to be honest. But that gave me the opportunity to work closely with you. I'd known you for several years. Now I could work closely with you because you were a member of the Seminole Institute of Medicine, which was examining nursing home oversight and quality in America. And I drew in, in my work on the Hill, I drew great inspiration from the seminal report you produced called Improving the Quality of Care in Nursing Homes. Also, that was an opportunity then to do all kinds of new things to the Older Americans Act, particularly strengthening the Ombudsman Program, legal services. And then in 1992, I had the privilege of being responsible for reauthorizing the Older Americans Act in the Senate and writing uh, the Elder Rights title of the Older Americans Act, Title VII. On a, on, a, on a bit of a lighter note here, I just have to ask you, is it true that a Minnesota legislator referred to you as, not my words, his words, quote, that little blonde broad who's always surrounded by wheelchairs? That is true. He was not an honorable person or one with um, social graces. I just had to laugh. But, but more importantly, that is a reminder that it was a time when the active nursing home residents and resident councils were really on the front line of nursing home reform. So, so there's a message and a lesson in there too. Uh, but speaking of which, is it true that you were called, quote, the man whom nursing home owners have nightmares about, end quote. And, and that is true. Unbelievable as it sounds, it is true. I was, it was the first uh, year of California's, they referred to as the senior legislature in those days. And so I was, as a volunteer, I was secretary to the Senate Health and Wel Welfare Committee of the senior legislature. And I was introduced by one of these senior centers to the group when we first convened who said, this is the man who nursing home owners have nightmares about. I was 31 years old, like who, who's, who's afraid of me? But it just demonstrated to me a couple of things. One, that um, a, a young person can make a, a nice mark in our world, uh, which is great because I, I think we're seeing that today. But secondly, um, it spoke to the power of the ombudsman and the ombudsman system in every state that they actually, if they were serious, um, the nursing home ministry needed to be concerned about them because they were really good advocates. And so as, as taken aback as I was by that statement, I remain very proud of it to this day. We'll call them badges of honor. What feels like it hasn't changed much or even a bit at all in your mind? Well, um, a few things uh, come to mind. Certainly staffing shortages in residential care, but equally so today um, in, in home care and other community services. Staffing shortages plus issues around training, issues around staff support, issues around compensation, issues around turnover, and the effect that that turnover has on the care people are getting and, and how that intimate level of care uh, requires relationships. All of those issues are now every bit as pressing, as urgent as they were then. Certainly the fear of retaliation um, for speaking out, and that's true of both residents and clients and patients and staff. Um, the constant tension between safety and uh, autonomy and, and how do we provide um, care that is centered on the person and is ethically satisfying. It's so hard. And, and I'm recalling, an, as an ombudsman, being in a care conference 
where the issue of the residents' autonomy was very much um, in focus and at some point in frustration, uh, her psychiatrist said to me, you're as crazy as she is, which was kind of a dampening um, to the <laughs> to the conversation. But I also knew then, and I might feel today, that, that the price of her autonomy was likely an involuntary discharge. It was a very, these, these are bad and very, very continuous issues that we face in our field. I would echo mm-hmm. everything that you just said, that's for sure. And, and more broadly, I would say what hasn't changed is that ageism remains pervasive in our society, and it's certainly pervasive in terms of public policy. Uh, whether in regard to uh, combating elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation, dealing with um, in, uh, the quality of care in nursing homes today. As you've put it in the past, I've heard you refer to ageism as a policy paradigm that older people are a problem to be solved. You know, and I think there's still a substantial view among policymakers, among the population at large, that older people already get a great deal of attention and government money in the form of Medicare and Social Security. And, and I, I worry that um, understanding of the forces, the dynamics that brought about Medicare and Social Security in the first place aren't remembered. People don't even know that. So this greedy geezer notion, unfortunately, I think remains out there. Um, you know, ageism is a significant barrier to improving aging policy. I, we see some glimmers of some things going on that are encouraging. Uh, the move towards developing master plans on aging, for example, at the state level is very encouraging. But I think it remains a significant barrier, particularly for the those who remain on the margins and remain vulnerable, like elder abuse clients uh, and the folks that we serve uh, in the ombudsman program, in adult protective services, and in other ways. What? What are some of the lessons that you take away, though, from the state and policy, state and federal policy uh, struggles that we began with in the early 1980s? One of them, I think, is that we have to seek out silver linings. You know, when things look like they're uh, going in the wrong direction, disturbing, find the silver linings. And the one that just pops to mind from our early days was, of course, all those efforts to deregulate the nursing home, to l- loosen the oversight, to cut back on survey and certification, all of that triggered members of Congress like Claude Pepper and my bosses, Senator Glenn and John Hines of Pennsylvania and others to undertake years of intensive work on trying to deal with nursing home reform, which resulted in Obra 87, which turned out to be a very bipartisan effort. Um, Of course, partisanship reared its head in those days, but nothing like today. And I think one of those other uh, lessons uh, that's so important today is that with nursing home reform, state and local ombudsmen and other advocates were critical to those successes. And I think that state and local advocates are perhaps even more important today when we look at sort of the paralysis that's going on at the federal level. How about you, Iris? I fully agree. And yes, those earlier years weren't um, uniform struggle. I'm, there's, I, it would probably sound blissful uh, by today's standard to say there's some, we experienced outstanding examples of bipartisan work uh, around the burgeoning field of financial exploitation, for example. And I, I kind of expect that that would happen because it was possible um, to find common ground uh, in preventing financial exploitation because there was really no one lobbying in favor of financial exploitation of vulnerable adults. I also recall working on a, a bill to, to provide d- dedicated funding for resident and family councils where our uh, House chief author was a, a Republican House member from up north in Duluth and the Senate chief author was from the inner city of Minneapolis. Uh, and and she was a Democrat. So yeah, really. Uh, but mostly what I, I learned in those years was that very few laws take effect, become real 
the president signs them or the governor signs them. There can be just forever uh, <laughs> and a day in rulemaking. Um, eligibility seems to be the one thing that that takes effect um, sooner, but uh, there can can be training that takes time. And certainly there is almost always with significant achievements, some level of backlash that um, backlash to the achievements <laughs> that turn up in amendments and repeal efforts in the next cycle and the cycle after that. Um, truly some change just must be generational. So Iris, looking back, what would you call the most satisfying achievement of your work so far? Thank you for this so far. Um, nothing is accomplished solo, but these two are ones that I pick for taking a lot of persistence. Um, the first is in indexing the Minnesota Nursing Home Residents Personal Security. When I started in the field, uh, the allowance was $25 a month. Um, every couple of months, would go to the legislature and ask for $5 more and then go back couple of years, $5 more. Uh, but we were working for several years on indexing the in increases to Social Security, and that occurred in 1988. Minnesota was the first state to do that. Um, Connecticut and the District of Columbia do now. Few other states connect theirs to other indices, but the federal minimum uh, remains at $30 a month as it was in the late 80s. And Ours has climbed to 125 a month. It is by no means the highest, but it is predictable. The other was the years from 1993 to 2012 that it took to enact um, in our vulnerable adult law, a felony neglect provision uh, for the most egregious intentional neglect by a caregiver, um, most typically family members. There's a considerable pushback uh, from the hospitals and the nursing homes concerned that uh, rogue prosecutors, as they called them, would be going after them in any election cycle. There have indeed been very few prosecutions under this provision because in fact, as we argued, the stiff conditions needed to charge and convict are providing the, the boundaries that, that were intended, but it was a very much needed tool for prosecutors in our state. And you, Bill? Well, like you, Iris, I agree, nothing is solo. We don't do it alone by any stretch of the imagination. But I think building California's long-term care ombudsman program, which including passing at the time, the nation's most comprehensive um, enabling legislation for the ombudsman program, which later became a model for a lot that ended up in the Older Americans Act and subsequent amendments. Um, one, one piece of legislation that just stands out in my memory that I am very proud of came out of an ombudsman case. And I won't go into the details, but the end result was law in California that prohibited um, nursing home employees and others with official responsibilities in a nursing home, including surveyors, for example, from acquiring the personal property of residents for anything less than its fair market value. Uh, at the time, we had cases in which um, operators and others were basically, in my judgment, swindling older adults out of their personal possessions. And we had to pass a law to say you can't do that. I'm very proud of the work we did on OBRA 87, definitely a highlight, um, as well as um, working on federal laws that established SHIP uh, and the SMP program, Senior Medicare Patrol Program. But the one I really wanna um, highlight here is the Elder Justice Act. Very involved in the writing and the passing of the Elder Justice Act. The original bill was bipartisan. It's not bipartisan these days, but we hope to get it back there. And taking many years, the law was first introduced in 2003. It was not enacted into law until 2010. And it took until 2021 to get the first ever federal funds dedicated to adult protective services. But we did that. That's a huge point of pride for me. So Iris, as we begin to wrap up here, I wanna ask you, what's one key principle that guides you professionally and personally today? To carry it on and carry it forward. I work very differently today because I'm 
in an intentionally supporting role. And that means happily no more late nights at the Capitol or counting pretzels from the vending machine as a food group. I serve on boards, I serve on committees, provide strategic advice uh, and fill in legislative history and do legislative research for colleagues on the front lines. Well, I think uh, uh, what guides me is the notion that we cannot let up and we can't rest on our laurels. No gains are assured for the long term. And I think that probably has never been more uh, truer than it is at the moment. Um, it's really important to me to help newer folks understand why their engagement in the policy process, engagement and advocacy is absolutely crucial. We just can't assume that others are taking care of it for us. I think advocacy at the congressional district level is more essential now than it's ever been before. And so I'm very eager to pass the baton on to a whole new generation of advocates and activists who are going to take us to the next level of achieving some of the things that we dreamed about and we have not yet seen come about. And so I am optimistic. So I'm just really grateful to see all these up and coming terrific advocates in our space. Indeed, Bill, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the OGs of Elder Justice. Do you have a suggestion for an OG you'd like to hear from? Drop us a line at nca at med.usc.edu. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Spotify to stay updated with our latest content. We appreciate your time and reviews, and we look forward to bringing you more engaging conversations. Mm -hmm.